Uh, welcome to Cornerstone's third webinar on <coughs> remote meetings. In this webinar, we're going to concentrate on practical lessons learned uh, by those involved so far and tips for the future. Our webcast slides and frequently asked questions from the previous sessions are, are all on our website. Uh, as will indeed be a webcast of, of this broadcast shortly following uh, this morning's session. So if you want to catch up on any of those, they're on Cornerstone's website and the details of that will appear on the last slide. Now, uh, many of you have sent in questions and as importantly, your experiences of meetings uh, and virtual meetings so far, for which we are very grateful. So thank you for that. Uh, we've sought to distill them and into themes and we'll be answering the questions uh, uh, from the start so we're not going to be going through the regulations we're going to be looking at uh, these topics that you can now see on the screen so our, our panel uh, to deal with those sadly won't include Ranjit Bose uh, and apologies for those who tuned in specifically to listen to his dulcet tones uh, but he's slightly under the weather today nothing serious I understand um, but uh, the remaining members of the panel uh, will uh, more than adequately cope, I hope. I will add a short session in the middle uh, under practical tips um, by more of a way of a, a lecture uh, or a talk than answering questions and then we'll come back to two more slides about questions later. Uh, within the confines of a webinar with uh, so many people involved, we've got about over 100 at the moment. Uh, we wish to encourage further uh, participation, as much participation as possible, through the question and answer function. Commenting, by all means, commenting on answers or on experiences so that those involved can see what other people are saying. We've tried to distill, as I said earlier, the experiences so far, but um, we will keep an eye on the question and answer functions. If you have further questions or further experiences, we'll try and weave those into the webinar as we go. Um, uh, we, although perhaps for, uh, usually for an, a session on oral virtual meetings, we think oral interventions by individuals will be just too difficult to cope with the, uh, and to manage effectively without any proper practice or training. We hope to finish in about 45 minutes and as I said, contact details for any follow up questions are on the last slide. There will be a feedback form which is online and the link will be shared towards the, the end of this morning's session. Now, one of the things that may happen with any session is it may go wrong and um, uh, it's important to have backup plans to deal with that. And so um, if I uh, fall away from the um, conversation because my internet's gone, we have a backup plan. And so in that sense, perhaps do as I say, not as I do. And certainly um, it, can, it can go wrong as, as the example on the screen shows. Um, so um, don't uh, think you're alone in dealing with um, difficult problems and teething issues in relation to um, virtual meetings. So that said, um, we'll move to the first uh, um, slide of questions that we prepared uh, and we're hoping to weave um, practice and our approach into these and the first question to see on the scheme I'm going to ask Damien to deal with uh, and uh, we'll deal with um, the these questions on the screen as we go forward so thank you very much and over to you Damien. James, thank you. The first question is, can members be invited to indicate their voting preferences in advance um, at full council meetings? Uh, uh, and the question I think originates in Newham. Um, we should make clear that the question is submitted is about items that don't give rise to a complaint of predetermination. So certainly not, for example, uh, thinking about a planning matter. More broadly, therefore, in answer to the question, um, not formally, because votes should be recorded um, at the time when the question is put. Um, so just to sort of expand it slightly, um, a councillor couldn't leave um, before a vote, um, having re 
uh, prior, uh, recorded their vote in a prior way, and that vote still count. Um, nor could their vote from an indicated earlier preference uh, count if they lost contact at the critical moment when the vote itself uh, was taken. Um, and it should always be borne in mind that uh, arguments should be heard so far as reasonable. Um, it is, however, in your discretion to make standing orders for virtual voting under Regulation 56A. Um, given one or two other suggestions, given that voting by roll call may be slower, um, if that's what you do, for example, than a show of hands in a chamber, um, it may be an idea to identify non-contentious business in advance, perhaps in discussion with group leaders, um, and invite them to consider speaking to their group colleagues. Um, with a view to the group leaders indicating their view on such, such business, um, perhaps without the need for extensive debate, that, might, um, that approach might have its uses. Uh, it might also be suggested to group leaders that they might discuss with their groups only perhaps pushing an issue to a vote, notwithstanding they express their view fully on it um, as they see fit, um, but only so far as the perhaps rather lengthier process involved in virtual voting might make it necessary to do so. Um, on to the next question and over to Rushi, I think. Thanks, Damien. <coughs> Sorry. Um, right, so the next question is what is the best method for ensuring accurate voting? And this is something we've touched on in our previous webinar. And um, while there is no one size fits all approach, it does strike us that a roll call is probably the most accurate way of recording votes. So there are other options. Um, you can have a show of hands, depending on how many members you have on screen. You can use a chat function, and you could also use a shared document that all um, members contribute to. But these do lend themselves more easily to mistakes or confusion. Um, as I think, as Damien indicated, a roll call might seem cumbersome when you have lots of members involved, but it is accurate. And we have also had two different authorities confirm to us that roll call, um, while lengthy, has worked for them quite effectively. Um, and I might also just add that actually with an old school style roll call, um, I would hope that you would avoid the type of mistake that the Chancellor made um, recently when he, you know, by mistake voted against his own government. Um, so I think for all those reasons, we'd probably say if you can, uh, roll call is probably the best way to do it. Um, I will now hand over to Matt. Thanks, Richie. So what impact does service interruption have on voting? Well, technically, if your member has suffered a lost connection, then they've not been in attendance at the meeting for as long as they've been outside, uh, they have lost their connection. So you'll have to make a judgment, the chair will have to make a judgment about whether that member's heard enough discussion in order to make a proper vote. Um, if the interruption happens during the voting, and if you're taking a roll call, for instance, that's really inconvenient, but I think you're going to have to start again just to make sure there can be no quibbles uh, about the validity of the vote. And hopefully your members don't use that as an opportunity to change their minds, because that will cause even more problems. Uh, now, uh, back to Damien. Matt, thank you. Um, the next question is how do we, or two part question is how do we deal with amendments to motions um, or calls for a named vote? Um, first part of that, I think coming from Bath and North East Somerset. Thank you for that. Um, short answer on the how do we deal with amendments is better in advance um, and to encourage you know, members in that direction. Um, unless it's very simple, inserting not after shall, for example, um, we suggest you, you should establish a process, perhaps make it a convention, which um, I know one authority has uh, set out a series of rules as conventions, um, to encourage any amendments to be submitted in writing, in time uh, to the clerk or the democratic services officer, uh, in sufficient time for the text to be checked, shared perhaps with all members present, perhaps put on the screen uh, in place of the, the main speaker at that moment or any other text that's being shown at that time. Um, we might suggest allowing the use of the chat line for that purpose, if at all, only for the very simplest of amendments, or not allow ruling it out for that purpose. Um, but you will need, to, because within it will be, amendments could be lost within other um, comments and are being made, but you will need some process for amendments um, and a clear um, acceptance that the chair has to decide what's within scope, what's reasonable at the time, and so on. And that may mean from time to time a short adjournment in certain cases, perhaps to brief the chair, uh, to circulate the amendment, to get the wording clear, uh, to clarify any terms or uncertainties with the mover. It's important that the chair is briefed that this is a possibility, 
of having to deal with amendments, um, and that he or she is in a position to keep control, say perhaps calling a short adjournment if required, being prepared to do so. Um, but then the, the chair explains to everyone what's happening, the process, uh, so that members and the, and the public are clear, um, and clarifying any queries or ensuring they're clarified as to process or content, um, perhaps by getting them clarified by the mover or by officers if the need arises. Um, on the second part of the question, a call for a named vote. If you're not using a roll call vote um, already, uh, and assuming your standing orders allow for a, a named vote to be called instead and whatever rules you have attached to that, um, then I think our suggestion would be that you establish an email route, perhaps a separate route, again, not the chat line, uh, to the clerk or democratic services officer, um, or that a member can raise it orally with the chair, but whichever, you then proceed in line with whatever existing or modified process you uh, have or put in place um, as to perhaps the proportion of members who need to decide uh, if uh, um, a roll call vote be taken, if that's your process, um, or whatever other um, procedural requirements you, you, you have in place or put in place. Um, James may have something to add on this. Yes, no, I, I agree with that, Damien. We've had one question that's come in during the course, which is, um, if you see on the question and answer function, could you ask if any councillors object abstain if the matter is non-contentious? Um, and in, in, uh, in my view, uh, I think that um, provided you're not forcing people to uh, indicate an absolute preference at the outset, trying to manage a meeting so you try and work out whether matters are contentious or non-contentious um, or what people are likely to do in advance before having to decide on the method of your voting if you decided to use a number of different methods then um, th that is perfectly acceptable so but you're, you've got to run the line between trying to elicit that information without trying to um, force people into divulging their, um, uh, their um, intentions um, beforehand. So th that's all I was going to add to that. Um, the, um, we will uh, move on now to the, to the next slide, please, Matt. Thank you. And um, for this slide, I think, Matt, you are uh, dealing with the first question. So I like this question very much. Should we be monitoring members to make sure they're paying attention? Well, I wonder how many of you do that already in in-person meetings? I have seen it done, but I think uh, mostly we leave it to members' judgment to work and, um, and their integrity to pay attention to uh, discussion of items on the agenda. Um, so I think in the context of remote meetings, it's kind of self-policing. Remember what uh, Dan and I were talking about last time, if you did join us last time, that there's a strong presumption in the regulations that you use video um, and that performs an important self-policing function, doesn't it? If you can see the member looking out the window or if they wear glasses like me, you can see ASOS being reflected back uh, on their glasses lenses. You know that they're not paying attention and it might be that the chair wants to politely remind uh, members that they should be paying attention and might even want to name and shame the member that seems distracted. Um, but think about how you can deal with these issues in advance. And we talked last time, I think, about a remote meetings etiquette. Um, so close down your emails, don't open other uh, pages on the browser. Um, Zoom used to have an attention tracking function, uh, which allowed the host of the meeting to know if someone had switched to another screen for longer than about 10 seconds. Uh, but after that uh, attracted a lot of criticism in the press, they removed that function. So it's up to you. I don't think it's necessary. I think the video will self-police that. I think um, I'm dealing with the next question, so I'll move on to that. Um, so this is, if members need clarification during their deliberations, how should they seek it? Um, now, this really depends on the situation and, you know, what type of clarification you're, um, you want. I think the specific question that we were asked was, in fact, about issues arising in private deliberations when the meeting was effectively closed and members were not actually going to return to announce the, the decision. And so in that kind of case, if the information you need is, you know, say, for example, from the applicant, say, what, you know, speaking um, about a licensing or planning application, I, I do think you will likely need to adjourn to a future date and defy your decision making 
particularly if you feel unable to make the decision in the absence of the further information that you need or the clarification that you need. Um, if, however, we're dealing with a different situation where actually you're, you're in open session, then usual principles apply. So you could um, just ask your question through the chair in the ordinary way that you would in a regular meeting. And um, one of the ways you could do that is by using the chat function to alert the chair that you have a query either for your officer or for um, the applicant or one of the other parties. Um, I'm going to hand over to Isabella now for the next question. Thanks, Richie. Um, so the next question is to do with new codes of conduct and I think it's unlikely that remote meetings will generate any new kind of misconduct beyond what's already dealt with in an authority's code of conduct but as Matt indicated it would be good practice to adopt a remote meetings protocol to clarify what will be expected of councillors in this particular context. Lawyers and local government and the Association of Democratic Services Officers have published a model protocol for remote meetings which suggests, for example, that councillors should join the meeting 15 minutes before the published start time to enable the equipment to be tested and that they should have nondescript background and should mute their microphone when they're not speaking to minimise background noise. Those suggestions have been included in remote meetings protocols adopted by a number of authorities, including Harrogate Borough Council, East Northamptonshire Council and Gloucestershire um, County Council. Others have gone further the protocol adopted by Guildford Borough Council also provides that councillors shouldn't work on other tasks, such as answering emails during the meeting, which links to what Matt was talking about just a moment ago. And their protocol also makes clear that the temptation to stay in your pyjamas has to be resisted and a dress code of smart casual is prescribed for remote meetings. Thank you. Um, as uh, one of the participants has indicated, uh, in his experience, members don't always pay attention at physical meetings anyway. Um, and certainly that's the experience of some of the meetings that I've attended, um, particularly with the advent of uh, mobile phones. Um, but uh, I agree with Isabella, the um, <clears throat> current code of conduct should be sufficient. It's how you police that and monitor it and the use of a protocol so that people know the behaviours that are expected um, and uh, are given tips as to what to avoid and what works and what doesn't work uh, can be very useful. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. And I think Rishi has the first um, question. Uh, thanks, James. Right, so this is about whether you should hold off on, um, you know, dealing with controversial business until we're back to normal. Um, the short answer, in my view, is no. Um, this is something that has come up quite a lot in discussions with my local authority clients and um, I, you know, I understand that you either, you know, there's, there's situations in which you just don't want to run the risk of virtual meetings for controversial decisions uh, and nor do you want such kind of decisions to be taken under delegated powers. Um, but that being said, there's two points um, worth bearing in mind. One, there is absolutely no clarity on when things will be back to normal, particularly when you think about um, you know, those members, either councillors or members of the public, who will still be at a risk and unable to participate in person, even when restrictions are, um, are relaxed. And this is something I think um, we're going to discuss in, in relation to the BSED as well. And then second and more fundamentally, um, I think the whole point of the regulations is to allow local authorities to continue their business and continue the effective delivery of their services, um, such as licensing and planning. And in fact, that's made quite clear in the explanatory uh, memorandum to the regulations. And so in my view, it would defeat the objective of having the flexibility regulations if you're just going to push off controversial decision making, which will um, often also be important decision making to some vague time in the future. And over to you, Matt, now for the next question. Thanks, Ruchi. So this is similar to the question I dealt with on voting. How do we judge when a drop connection means that a member that is no longer in remote uh, attendance at all? Um, it will depend, I think, on the length of the interruption. Um, it's a question of judgment. There's no hard and fast rules on this. The significance, of course, is that if the member hasn't got a connection, they're not in attendance at the meeting. Um, and it will come, there will come a point where the, um, the lost connection has gone on for such a long time that they are no longer in attendance. Um, James will come back to this in his section on practical tips, but I think the solution here is to have someone who's monitoring um, 
members connections and is available to help out with IT problems like this. The reason why you want someone monitoring is that issues like this can be picked up quickly and discussion of that item can be paused in the hope that the member can be brought back into the meeting or if necessary continued without the member or maybe adjourned to later in the meeting or uh, to a later date. Um, so I think the chair's role here is really crucial to control the meeting and pause discussion where things go wrong in, in IT terms. Um, over to Isabella now for the next two questions. Thanks, Matt. Um, so the starting point in answering this question about the public sector equality duty, which is one that we've received quite a few times, is that the remote meetings regulations are essentially permissive in their approach. They suggest that the meetings will be acceptable if streamed online, even if particular members of the public can't access them, for example, for reasons of network coverage or lack of equipment or knowledge. The second thing to remember is that the PSED is not a duty to achieve a particular result, but a duty to have regard to certain equality matters. So it requires authorities to be thinking about how they can make virtual meetings accessible to people with protected characteristics. But it doesn't mean that meetings can't be conducted virtually because some people with protected characteristics might not be able to access them. I think the key in practical terms is to focus on being user friendly. So, for example, you might need to explain in a few brief steps how to access a Zoom meeting for the benefit of those protected groups who might have lower levels of online participation, such as the elderly. Um, the other thing to think about, um, although it might be sometime in the future, is what Ruchi mentioned, which is that when meetings can be conducted in person again with certain social distancing measures, it's likely that you'll still need to use remote technology to enable individuals who have to self-isolate for an extended period due to underlying health issues or age um, to attend. So you might have in effect part per in person and, and part remote hearings um, meetings. And then the last question on that slide was to do with um, the position in Wales. And the Welsh meetings regulations were made three weeks after the English regulations and are different in two main respects. First, in Wales, local authorities do not have to make use of video conferencing technology, even where practicable. So there's a requirement for members to hear and be heard, but no requirement for them to be seen and be seen. Um, the second difference or main difference is that the Welsh regulations take a different approach to public attendance and participation. Um, principally by disapplying Section 1.1 of the Public Bodies Admissions to Meetings Act 1960 in respect of community council meetings. Whether such councils can always proceed without public attendance, without breaching their public or obligations, might be something on which specific advice will be needed. Um, but the general um, perspective is that the practical implications and our advice and tips apply in Wales as much as they do in England. Um, thank you very much, Isabella. Um, now, uh, we're going to move on to practical tips. And if we can have the next slide, please, Mac. Thank you. So one of the um, practical tips that you might have is, for instance, to use a headset. And I've just started to use a headset. Um, and it not only makes li listening easier, hopefully it includes the audibility of uh, the delivery. Um, particularly if you have a slightly weak uh, internet connection. Um, so th that's a, a practical tip that um, uh, a, a number of organizations use. Uh, blurring backgrounds. Uh, uh, none of uh, the presenters today are shy about showing off their background. And will, um, but uh, for particular counselors, um, th there, is, there is the ability in, in most um, platforms that uh, for meetings to blur backgrounds so that that enables one firstly to concentrate on the speaker and secondly uh, to avoid any implications about the type of background uh, against which they are uh, presenting. If I move on to managing the meeting, um, one of the um, uh, pieces of advice we received from several um, councils is that uh, Obviously, one should set up a group to start with to manage meetings to cover all the issues from ICT to um, GDPR issues. And so if you've got a group that is well versed in, in what's going on, then that group may not be needed for every meeting, depending on what type of meeting is taking place. 
but you will have the individual expertise uh, um, from those groups. So it won't just be the monitoring officer and democratic services. You should be considering involving other members of the council team as well. So look, looking at the particular issues I've raised here, pre-meeting security, host control, um, letting people into the waiting areas, checking their identity, making sure that when the meeting starts, and that's another point that you should get everyone to be clocking in sometime before the meeting starts, um, that you know who's there, you know who shouldn't be there, and so you can prevent them coming into the meeting and uh, uh, everyone is ready to go at the appointed hour. Um, muting speakers, um, as you'll see in, in We've all muted ourselves when we're not speaking. Hopefully that doesn't um, uh, uh, cause problems with handover. Um, but uh, muting uh, people who aren't speaking uh, firstly encourages uh, proper behavior so that people don't um, try and speak on top of each other. And when the, if necessary, the chair or some other officer can be controlling uh, the muting of speakers uh, um, uh, centrally. Uh, cameras on or off is the question we've been asked. Should cameras be off um, when people aren't speaking? Um, uh, some councillors understand and may feel the need to want to have their presence advertised throughout the meeting, but most of the time if you think of how the public view a meeting, they see the backs of councillors and they see the, if you like, the stage party, the, the who are up on the stage. So our, our view is, um, depending on how much pressure you're getting from members, is that cameras should be off um, if people aren't speaking, uh, but particularly when you've got large numbers of groups. If you've got a small committee of three or four people, then it's um, quite straightforward to have the cameras on all the time. But otherwise, our suggestion is cameras off. Um, how do you alert the chair? Um, hands up functions the question and uh, um, or sticking your hand up in the air is unlikely to work with a, a large number of people and you can get um, delays so the the feedback we've had is that the use of the chat function for alerting a chair or a clerk if someone wants to speak or indeed leave a meeting is is the best way forward so it's those type of uh, small details that um, uh, can assist and then finally on this slide coming to roles um, the um, just had um, interesting observation from uh, Maggie Camp that their um, IC team actually hosts the meeting taking the pressure off their monitoring officer and democratic services team and uh, one ICT member of staff is in contact with another in the background that can be contacted directly by telephone if they're having problems during the meeting and that's exactly the type of um, provision that should be made. Um, we also think that it would be sensible to have somebody monitoring the output so that if the, if the meeting is being streamed to the public, someone is looking to see from the public's pers perspective what they can see. So if there is an issue uh, with that, it can be brought to the chair's attention as soon as possible and rectified with a short pause in the meeting so that you don't have the problems of the meeting potentially running on without the public being there and uh, issues arising uh, from that um, type of issue. So um, the <clears throat> those are our uh, host of practical tips, but that's our... Um, uh, practical tips for organizing the meeting and then I'm going to turn to the next side uh, which I've called risk of challenge and um, <clears throat> uh, the most important uh, piece of advice I think we can give is preparation is key for officers and members to practice on the equipment and have wash-up sessions afterwards and not just even for officers and members. If you're having external speakers or um, uh, other members from the council who don't normally speak at meetings speaking, make sure that they are their connections work well in advance of the meeting. Make sure they're aware of how the functions work. Maybe have a clerk or a, an officer um, go through a, a short practice session with them so that when it comes to the actual um, 
meeting itself, uh, they're well versed in what to do. And they're not having to try and uh, manipulate their equipment for the first time. So preparation and practice sessions is absolutely key. And for instance, uh, we've had a couple of practice sessions for today for this webinar, um, making sure that at least as far as possible anyway, we all know what we're meant to be doing and when. Um, more difficult for a, a live meeting where you don't know what the intervention is going to be, but um, practice um, and preparation is the absolute key feedback message that we've had from those being involved so far. And uh, if that involves taking up more time for officers and members, so be it. Uh, to a certain extent, voting procedure and fallback uh, uh, has been dealt with already. Um, uh, have telephone numbers, um, I mentioned a moment ago. If, if people fall out of communication, have other lines of communication that aren't dependent upon the internet, if at all possible, available so that contact can be made and uh, normal service resumed, if at all possible. Um, the third bullet point perhaps highlights the most important matter is the importance of the chair having a script for um, likely scenarios. Uh, what happens if one or more members uh, drop off communication, for instance? What ha how to go into a private session if need be? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, and this is an issue raised by a question received earlier, when you go into private session, the chair should be asking members to make sure they're, they're the only person in the room so that it is properly private. Um, uh, maybe record that that should happen. Uh, so that the chair working in close conjunction with officers um, in advance should hopefully be able to prepare and manage for the meeting uh, and to make it go smoothly. And lastly, um, it's just a, a suggestion, a possible future suggestion, um, as we move slowly out of lockdown, and I've heard of one council doing this, splitting real and virtual meetings, so that maybe the chair and the support team in, in a big room suitably socially distanced um, where with other members um, on uh, video so that those that are managing the meeting can do so um, and communicate within each other to ensure the meeting is effective uh, without having to use electronic communication um, that just makes life a lot easier um, there are a number of questions have come in whilst I've been speaking. I'll see if I can pick those up uh, uh, later, but we'll move on to our next uh, slide. And um, I believe Rishi's, um, uh, before we get to Rishi, I think Matt has something to say. So a cautionary tale, um, if it was needed, of, um, of perhaps the, or perhaps an advert for the benefit of a blurred background. Um, you might have uh, come across in the press or on social media, great fascination with the backgrounds of people, particularly people in the public eye on Zoom. But it seems like our health secretary is a genre unto himself. So over to Rishi for the next question. Thanks, James. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll pick up the first question on conferencing platforms. And um, we have been asked a number of times about parties or participants that can't access the internet. Um, this is something we've touched on before, but essentially, practically speaking, most platforms, um, and at least the ones that we've been using, do allow participants to join in via the telephone. It doesn't have to be video, so you can just dial in instead, and you will have audio, audio participation. Um, in fact, I can see this morning that eight participants participants have dialed into this webinar by telephone, so it is clearly possible to take part um, without having the internet. Um, and then legally as well, um, you know, the legal requirements which, which we've discussed previously is that um, as far as um, members of the public who are entitled to speak are concerned, councillors obviously need to hear them, but as far as um, seeing them, that's obviously subject to, uh, you know, where practicable. So it's, it's not really a problem in, in legal terms if someone dies in by audio only. Um, and that leads me to the next question, which is about fairness and, you know, what about um, where one participant joins in via video and the others only have an audio connection. Um, so, you know, this might be in the case of, um, say, again, if you have a licensing or planning application and the applicant either just 
dials in by telephone or some of the objectors don't have um, um, internet access and therefore dial in by telephone. Um, I think, strictly speaking, there's nothing inherently unfair in one participant joining in by telephone and the others having um, the video interaction. Um, I think you just have to make sure that you're mindful of the difference and provided you have good protocols in place. So, you know, ensure um, kind of strict sharing, allowing each party an equal and proper time to make their representations. Um, where, you know, where applicants are involved, you might um, in, indeed allow them time to consult if necessary with a legal representative that they might have, um, etc. So I, I think as long as you build in fairness into your procedure, I can't see how there's any inherent fairness in one person not being able to see, um, you know, the, the, the members or councillors live and can only hear them. Um, so I, I think, yes, just, just be mindful and um, make, you know, make extra provisions for time and consultation if necessary. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Matt. Okay, so I think there are three questions here. I'll start with the middle question. Do we need to live stream the meeting? And my uh, answer to that question is yes. Um, you need to make the public, uh, you need to have an, a means for the public to access the meeting. And the live stream is really the, the obvious and probably the most convenient way of doing that. So you do need to have some form of public broadcast of the meeting unless you're excluding uh, members of the public in the limited circumstances that law, the law allows you to do that. Um, how do you do so? I think most authorities seem to have adopted the YouTube solution. So the meeting takes place on a platform like Zoom uh, and that footage is simply broadcast passively out via YouTube. Um, you can um, broadcast webcast directly out of platforms like Zoom and Teams. That might be another solution. There are lots of different ways of doing it. Remember what we emphasized in the last two webinars, it's a meeting in public, it's not a public meeting. Um, so it doesn't have to be fully participatory, only the people who have a legal right to speak and address the meeting uh, need to have access to a microphone. What happens if the webcast goes down? Well, that's a, potentially a big problem because that means that none of your members are in attendance. Um, because the public and the public have probably been unlawfully excluded. So that, that meeting needs to at the very least be paused while the situation is investigated and hopefully the live stream is recovered. Now, if it's not, I think you've got two options and hopefully you've thought about these in advance. Firstly, um, as Ruchi said, and it's actually quite an important point, have a backup. And that could be as simple as a telephone number for people to dial in a bit like how in the 1990s we used to dial our football club's club line on the premium rate and listen into the latest club news. In my reading of the regulations, that is a lawful way of allowing the public access to the meeting and therefore allowing it to continue. And if you've made available uh, that phone number in advance, so members of the public know what to do in case of um, emergency, then I think you can continue with the meeting, although it might be sensible to try and uh, to pause the meeting to try and recover the audio, uh, uh, sorry, the live stream uh, broadcast. If that's not an option or you haven't thought about that in advance, also think it would also be a good idea to have a backup date earmarked just in case things go wrong. And I know at least one council have done that. And I think that's excellent practice so that uh, all the participants, including members of the public know that if something does go wrong and the live stream is dropped, then um, the meeting will simply be adjourned and resumed on that full, uh, full back date and everybody knows where they stand. Um, I'm also tackling the fourth question. Um, I've talked about this in the first webinar, the security of particularly, uh, particularly of Zoom. I can't help but think that a lot of the um, security issues that have been uh, thrown at Zoom and to a lesser extent at some of the other platforms are a little bit overblown. And around the time that we did our first webinar, the public mood definitely seemed to be souring against Zoom. I think we had got over the novelty of pub quizzes and yoga classes and catch ups with our families and starting to think, well, our whole lives are being conducted over video conferencing. Um, the main security problems with Zoom, as I understand them, as a lawyer rather than as an IT expert, are that uh, the meeting settings were very permissive by default and inexperienced users who were using it for purposes that Zoom was never intended for weren't sophisticated enough to lock down their meeting and control who had access to the meeting and who could speak and who could share. Uh, their screens, for instance. So if you've locked down the meeting security settings, as James uh, outlined in his practical tips section, I think that resolves most of the security issues that affect Zoom and the other platforms. If a party refuses to use um, 
video conferencing. I would push back quite hard on that. I think unless you're planning to declare war on your neighbouring authority, it's unlikely that you're discussing anything so sensitive that it couldn't be discussed on a platform like Zoom. Um, so I think that's probably not a good reason for refusing to participate. And I uh, would obviously try to encourage them to use, um, use your chosen platform to explain exactly what the security risks that they're concerned about are. It may be that they've received um, a kind of message from corporate IT. I know this is particularly an issue with the police um, that Zoom can't be used for any purpose at all. So it might be that you want to try and find a way around that by adopting a new platform, perhaps for that particular meeting. But at the end of the day, the, your legal obligation is to make um, available the meeting by some form of uh, remote technology and ultimately it's your choice and there are lots of factors that will go into that so the convenience of access for members for officers for members of the public as well as the party that's digging their heels in over security issues so if they uh, if you decide to proceed with the meeting using your chosen platform and that party refuses to participate i think that's their choice and you can carry on uh, back to james thank you one of the questions that's come in that's really a point is is um, from Clive Tobin. Would the panel agree that authorities should strive for video access where possible, since this can help identify whether a party is known to a member and therefore a conflict exists? Um, I'm not sure I'd be brave and try and speak for the panel, but I would have said yes, we do agree with that, and that's a very good reason why you should have uh, video access, and pr pr probably even in in Wales, even if it's not required, um, because. Uh, video access is, if you can provide it for everyone, does um, uh, enable people to see each other and face-to-face -face impact is important, notwithstanding what Rishi said about what happens if some people don't have access to the technology. Um, so strive if possible. Um, uh, I think we would all agree. Uh, I don't see anyone in the panel that I can see disagreeing with me. I, I do, uh, there's a further question saying from somebody that they don't, their authority doesn't stream live. Um, uh, members prefer the opportunity to edit if need be, um, if somebody becomes unruly or profane. Um, uh, you can, once it's published via YouTube, you can't get it back. Uh, I don't know whether Matt, you have a, I think you were covering that topic, whether you have a particular comment on that. One can understand the concern um, and um, uh, provided that um, <clears throat> the, the people who have access to the meeting are there. I don't know what your view is as to live, uh, delayed live stream. Mm -hmm. I don't like the sound of it, I'm afraid. Um, I think uh, we, we covered this on the previous webinar as well. I think some form of live broadcast is required and you have to take the risk that people, people will be badly behaved because ultimately this is a about um, democracy in action and it's it should be as close as possible replicating the experience of turning up uh, to the council chamber and watching um, things go wrong and I've certainly I remember being at Camden Town Hall at the time that the Mayor of London was uh, taking questions on proposals to buy water cannon and that was obviously a source of disruption these things happen in real life and they're they're probably more likely to happen online but I think that's part and parcel of moving local authority business into uh, onto remote technology. James, do you mind if I also address Joe's question about Please Zoom being best platform? Because I think I overlooked that one. Um, I'm not going to make a recommendation about best platforms. What I would say about Zoom is I think for most council businesses, it's absolutely fine to use. Um, and I think quite a lot of local authorities, judging from the questions we've had and feedback we've had directly from clients have been using Zoom, mm. sometimes with issue, but for the most part, absolutely fine. So I think um, I wouldn't, uh, discourage people from using Zoom is my answer. Thank you, Matt. I'm just going to pick up on the point you made there that the alternative for dealing with unruly or profane people is having your member of the ICT there ready to um, uh, <clears throat> take control as soon as that starts, have a short intermission, have your chair briefed so that they're ready to deal with that. Maybe a potentially a short interruption to the broadcast, but that's not going to um, cause conflict with the rules and then you can proceed once that particular public speaker um, has been either uh, started to behave or has been muted and um, uh, uh, if necessarily ejected effectively from the meeting which is what would happen as Matt said in, in, in real life. 
Uh, last question um, <clears throat> that's come in just to pick that up before we get to the last screen. Do you think it's essential to have access to the meeting via a telephone line as well as a video conferencing platform? Uh, I'm going to take that on board. And to my mind, yes, as a fallback, um, <clears throat> um, because without um, a telephone line access, um, uh, or uh, <clears throat> there's um, pro there can be real problems. The video conferencing goes down, and some people won't have access to it. So if it's a possible, try to unless it goes far and say it's essential that you should be striving to do it. Um, well, let's move on to the last slide. We've slightly overrun, but we did start slightly late, and we've been doing questions. We've been going through, and I think Isabella's got the first question on the last slide. Thanks, James. Um, so the first one is about making um, documents available during the meeting. And Regulation 15 of the new regulations provides that a document will be made available at the council offices if it's published on the council's website. There's a bit of a mismatch there with Section 100, 100 capital B and um, Subsection 6 of the 1972 Act, um, which concerns making the documents available kind of in the meeting room be it virtual or in person, which might not necessarily be at the council offices. Sensibly though, it's difficult to see how authorities could be expected to make the agenda and background papers available other than by having it on the website. But some thought might need to be given about making the documents easy to find on the website rather than buried away behind multiple pages. And it might be a good idea to email around links to the documents, particularly if changes are made at the last minute. And I think we're now over to Damien for the last two questions. Thank you, James. Um, first question, is it sufficient to limit members of the public to making uh, written statements or do we need to allow uh, live statements? And um, the answer, picking up, uh, carrying on from something Matt said, is it depends on the member of the public. Um, if they're one of those entitled to attend the meeting in order to exercise a right to speak on the item, then they're being heard and where practical scenes we've said, uh, by the councillors um, is a condition of the attendance of those councillors, uh, Reg 53B. Um, in the same way, it's also a condition um, that those persons who are entitled um, to attend to speak, that likewise they are being able to hear and where practicable um, uh, see the councillors. Um, so if the member of the public is in that position in relation to the item, um, allowing them to make a written submission only is not sufficient. Uh, they have the right to make their statement live, virtually, obviously, um, and to be heard or present in the sense of being seen, if practicable, in the ways described. But obviously, the extent of their right, the speaking length and so on, um, what it applies to depends on your, your local rules or standing orders. But if the member of the public doesn't have that right, um, then allowing them to submit a written statement may well be um, sufficient, with the council perhaps exercising discretion depending on its rules on issues such as the amount of notice for such a statement required, whether it has to be circulated perhaps to councillors, whether it's read out or whether the chair has a discretion whether to read it out and so on. That will be a matter within your own um, your rules or rules as created. But in general, the more those present at a virtual meeting understand the process of the business and the content of the business, the more likely it is that the virtual decision making process will be accepted as, as the, the best that can be done and in particular that it should be fair. Um, moving on to the um, FOI implications, and in that I include the Environmental Information Regulations 2004, um, because much of the material of local government also covers things, obviously covers things like planning, waste, transport, and environmental health, much of which, or most of which, will be under those regulations. The recordings of the meetings, um, things like chat remarks, if they're kept in the, in the electronic records, will be information recorded in any form, as the FOI Act, Section 84 puts it, and so within the scope of requests. Um, the recordings will include the personal data of the participants, for example, the members of the public who've spoken, um, more than perhaps previously would be the case in terms of record, unless you, you know, film already. Um, there, may be, uh, the, there may be some deeming uh, as to consent for its later release, perhaps under an information request, or for remaining on your website in the public uh, view. Um, but this might be thought to wane after a reasonable period. And indeed to support that consent, it may be important to inform participants beforehand that the proceedings will be recorded or remind them of that and that they will remain publicly available if they will. 
Otherwise, if the records are no longer on your website, um, a disclosure of personal data in response to a request, if it were made under FOI or EIR, um, would need to rely on the legitimate interests law for basis in, uh, under Section 40 of the Act or Regulation 13. Um, privacy notices. Um, the question prompts the, the, the point that privacy notices perhaps should be considered as to whether they need um, amendment to refer to the fact that you're processing video and audio data of the public and so on. Um, there is a twist, as uh, Isabella's touched on, where paper copies of reports may need to be um, supplied under um, FOI if they're requested. Um, well, certainly I mentioned this in a previous uh, uh, seminar, um, even though they're obviously available on the website and we've described other ways um, of which they may be available electronically as well, um, where the duty to supply them hasn't been disapplied and that's the case with council functions as I mentioned in the previous um, webinar. Um, you'll need to be ready to deal with requests about virtual meetings materials, some people may try and test compliance as I've said before, um, deal with as, as much as possible under normal business. If you can make it readily available, the commissioner will assist you in doing that. Um, if they insist on a formal response, if it's FOI, redirect them to the website uh, and the section 21 exemption under FOI, information accessible by other means, uh, an absolute exemption will be available. There isn't such an exemption under the EIRs, um, but likewise treat it as business as usual if it's uh, readily uh, available elsewhere and use your advise and assist duty regulation nine to point them to the website although in the end the requester can enforce the request through the EIR process if they wish to do so. And finally, as I mentioned in the first webinar, the ICO has said that in her documents that she's not penalising authorities over FOI and EIR requests while they're prioritising other areas. There's a statement issued on the 15th of April. She does say we expect appropriate measures to be taken to keep records. Um, that's all I had, James, thank you. Thank you, Damien, and thank, thank you to all members of the panel. I'm just dealing with one of the final questions that's come in. Uh, would the panel agree that it's unlawful to insist on reduced but still proportionate size committees out with the Constitution's provision and or preventing hybrid meetings? Um, certainly to my mind, uh, and I'm um, keeping an eye on the panel to see if anyone disagrees, um, uh, it, it would be unlawful. If the Constitution requires a certain number of um, members at a particular committee, um, or makes provision for them, you, there's nothing in the, in the regulations which allows you to go behind that. So um, uh, if you, I, I'm aware of some authorities that have reduced committee sizes or have had hybrid committees to try and facilitate these, and that's perfectly acceptable provided they make the constitutional changes first. Um, you can't just ignore your constitution uh, because of the crisis. There are some provisions within the flex within your constitution which will be overridden by the flexibility regulations but um, but that is uh, 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 not one of them um, lastly just um, uh, <coughs> um, just to, to touch on one that's been answered online what about a legal representative? presumably at some form of regulatory hearing saying they can't represent their client properly for remote audio only hearing. Um, two answers to that to add to what's been given is that uh, is to reinforce Matt's point that there have been um, and I've been involved in three court of appeal hearings where um, we've had uh, hearings in front of three judges um, where uh, the legal teams have to uh, make provision for uh, communication with their own teams and uh, there shouldn't be any different reason why that cannot be done at a council hearing. Second is that um, when you're having the type of hearing where legal representation is necessary that's just the type of um, uh, circumstance where um, running through how things will work in advance so that if the legal representative says that I think there will be a problem um, practical solutions can be found to it. Um, it usually involves having um, a parallel line of communication or uh, them suitably socially distanced in the same premises as their client. Um, that's uh, I think all the questions answered today. I just remind you as it should have come up in the chat functions to fill in your feedback form if at all possible. So thank you for taking part. To thank again those that provided their experiences 
which enabled us to hopefully provide some focused questions and answers to you uh, and uh, to hope you all enjoy the rest of the day and keep safe. So thank you very much indeed.